It's time to set aside the superficial. It's time to go deeper. It's time to engage in truth. Here's John Bornstein. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to Engage in Truth. This is John Bornstein. I'm a senior pastor of Calvary Fellowship Fountain Valley Church right here in Colorado Springs. And I'm thrilled that you're tuning in because we are continuing in our study of First Corinthians. Now, it's taken us a few weeks to get to this point, but we're finally in the chapter that many of you have been sending in some comments regarding. A lot of questions out there regarding First Corinthians chapter 14 on this subject of tongues. So I've titled this Untying the Confusion, and that's what the subject of tongues can often do because there's so many perspectives on the subject of tongues, the spiritual gift of tongues that the Apostle Paul uh, really communicates through 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 as he highlights these spiritual gifts. And so we spent some time in it, just a little bit, uh, on the subject of tongues back in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you've missed any of our prior broadcasts, you can go to calvaryfountain.com, and there is a drop-down button there on the website. It says video and audio. You can click and watch uh, prior uh, sermons on video there. In fact, there's several hundred that are archived, so you can go and watch these if you prefer, but you can listen to it here. These are a little bit uh, shorter messages. We've got about 25 minutes here together, and so we'll go through this over the next few weeks, really talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And so the prior audio broadcast, if you missed our study, again, those are there as well. You can also sign up for our podcast, all at calvaryfountain.com. But we're going to spend, again, the next few weeks here covering this as an expository verse-by-verse church. Most of our studies are going to spend a lot of time as we go through this detail by detail, looking at the personal application and trying to understand exactly what we're being told to do here. This is the the process of exegesis as we go into this study of God's holy word and then chapter by chapter, even taking on these hotly debated subjects. We're not going to skirt that. We've got to really go into this and understand it because this has divided churches. It's unfortunate to say that, but it's reality. We often major in the minors and, and, and lose focus of the main things of Jesus Christ our Lord, and, and then try to get a little bit more spiritual than another church. You know, we try to, to implore new things and, and actively pursue things that distinguish us from other churches. No, we, we want to activate a new type of sound, a new look, a, a, a new smell even in auditoriums. And, and there becomes this competition in churches that really should never be. And so let's really examine this quite closely so you can better understand this, this powerful text. And just like we did through our Revelation study, we're going to go through some of the challenging texts that, again, I'm the messenger And yes, I have some opinions. I'm going to try to put my opinions aside as we go through this study. I don't want to get so caught up in things. I certainly don't want to offend you. It's important that I communicate this accurately, and so I, I don't want to uh, overtly uh, you know, put a strong emphasis on one particular side of a point, but rather just give you the information and, and allow God to lead by way of His Holy Spirit. I don't want to offend brothers and sisters out there, and so I'm welcome to receive, uh, honored to receive your, your requests, your questions, and certainly go through this uh, to greater detail, even on a personal level. I could send you some more detail via email even. So again, you can reach out to us at Cal. Calvaryfountain.com. But here we are. Let's let's just look at this. Uh, I, I, let me just start off with this. I, I before we really get into the detail of it, you know, today we communicate differently. I mean, we really have a lot of different tools that we use to communicate with folks. One, for example, is texting. And this seems to be today's primary mode of communication. I mean, even in according to a Gallup poll back in 2016. Texting has really started to dominate the way we communicate with one another. I mean, SMS was an it was invented in 1984, believe it or not. And today, almost three billion people are texting via smartphones. Yet texting is not always the best form of communication, really. I mean, if you think about it, look how easy it is to misunderstand people. 
even people we know quite well. While the sender understands the intent of their words, the recipient may not always have that same degree of perception. Uh, the, The recipient can read into the text even, read between the lines. They start to formulate ideas. What was the tone of voice that was used? Are they using a strong emphasis in that? Are they being rude? Is there sarcasm here? They're trying to pick up the tone that was used in that communication. And it should cause us all then to carefully read our messages and pause before we respond and hit that send button. We've all been guilty of that in email. Now it seems to be even worse via text or even iMessages and all sorts of ways that we communicate via written information. And today, even text, it's just terrible because we don't even use proper uh, punctuation. Uh, We don't go to the extra distance of time involved to communicate uh, thoroughly. And therefore, things can get lost in translation. So here we need to be very cautious. Again, many churches, many denominations based upon some of these writings And we need to be very cautious when reading a letter to a church that was written 2,000 years ago because it can be a challenging endeavor to properly interpret and understand the text as it applies even today. Now, we know that Scripture is timeless. It is the Word of God. He is never changing. But we also have to understand the context to which Paul was writing and the full context of the entire book of 1 Corinthians. So we have to make sure to really proper, properly use exegesis in this and not use eisegesis as it may fit our narrative in the modern context. So it's easy to misunderstand any author, especially the author's intent and what was taking place in the life of the church at that particular moment. So often God, God's people will do this. We jump to conclusions before carefully studying a biblical passage, and this should give us great cause and great concern by some of the behaviors that we're seeing today. We need to spend a great deal of time in this. We're all guilty. So our aim here is that we must understand the words of Scripture in the way God intended them to be understood. That comes by way of discernment of the Holy Spirit. We must try not to read our own traditions preferences or even experiences into God's Word. Very difficult to do because many of you who are listening right now have probably grown up in the church in some way. You're you're susceptible to this. We all are. Uh, Traditions, the way we've been taught and raised, all become lenses that we look through. So it's especially important when it comes to controversial areas of worship and spiritual gifts, that we don't do that. So I'm hoping with me, what you can do is put aside your own perspectives for a moment, listen through these studies over the next few weeks, and really come to a biblical conclusion because you're using the Bible wholly as your roadmap for this discussion of the subject of tongues. So again, over the next few weeks, we're going to be examining this 1 Corinthians chapter 14 study And it really should be something that we do with, uh, I believe that is worship, is this this is really calling us to orderly worship, intelligent worship. We need to use the framework here that the Apostle Paul was trying to rid the church of unhealthy behaviors, confusion, chaos that was ensuing in some ways that he is trying to put things back into order. So our construct needs to be built around that wire frame that this is to give orderly, wise, intelligent, God-honoring worship as the instruction that's given here. So let's pick up verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And what we need to take away from this is that clear communication in the church is critical. Okay, it's, it's critical in business, it's critical in marriage, in every aspect of life, so clear communication in the church is critical. Listen to these words, verse 1, 1 Corinthians 14, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Okay, let's pause there for a moment. First and foremost, Paul commands the church to pursue, strive for, seek after love. Pursue love. That's the first thing here. Uh, This means to pursue or even to the point a strong, intense word here to where someone may even receive persecution to that level of pursuit. 
Okay, it can be an elusive thing. We know that love, especially as we've just been over the last few weeks in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, talking about agape love. This can be something that is ever fleeting, something we're grasping for and struggling to do with any type of accuracy or even biblical context to. I mean, true agape love is totally selfless. It is totally pure and undefiled. It is a God love. It's an agape love. And it's something that we strive for through the way of the Holy Spirit, right? The, this is a gift of the Holy Spirit to love like that. So, in other words, we do not find love by wishful thinking. It's not by some half-hearted effort. The Apostle Paul wants us to pursue it, even self-sacrificing pursuit, that's needed here. We have to pursue it eagerly every day if we're going to find it operating in our lives as it should be. So as a church, if we make love our top pursuit, we'll discover that our capacity to minister to those around us grows with every passing year. We're going to find ourselves able to minister to those around us better, more effectively, because if we don't love the Lord with all of our heart, with all of our strength, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, how can we possibly love those around us if we don't love God like that? That's where it begins. That love begins with a a love relationship between us and the Lord to truly love Him. If we love Him, we'll keep His commandments. If we truly love Him, we'll be able to minister to others with grace and compassion and a desire, earnest desire for their salvation and their, their own pursuit of truth and love of the Lord, right? To go deeper into His holy word. We'll care about their life. We'll care about them. We are our brother's keeper. So Paul commands the church to desire earnestly spiritual gifts. And particularly, he highlights here, prophecy. Now, he uses the word pneumatica, which is a spiritual gift, as he did in chapter 12, verse 1, rather than charismata, which we see in verse 4 and 9, 28, 30, and 31 of chapter 12. So he uses a different word here, but these two words are synonyms. The former stresses the spirit as the source. The latter stresses the gift as an outpouring of grace. Okay, this is why the word gifts is italicized in your text. So it'd be like saying, desire the Holy Spirit working in and through you. That's the way we should interpret that. So how many of us really ask God to work in and through us to be more spiritual? I mean, if we're really honest... Most might come to the conclusion that they only want to be good enough. I can be spiritual on Sunday morning, but maybe before meals and sometimes before bed. But don't ask me to be too spiritual. We really don't desire to be truly spiritual people. And that's the problem. We don't wholly want to be in the presence of the Lord all the time. We want to compartmentalize God. We want to compartmentalize that relationship and maybe turn off his omnipresence sometimes, his all-seeing eye, his all-hearing ears. We, we just want to be in his presence sometimes and then dabble in the world the other time. Maybe he'll turn a blind eye and a deaf ear to these things over here. So we find a balance that we try to be just good enough right? That I'm better than so-and-so. I have less sin than so-and-so. And finding ourselves justifying ourselves just like the Pharisees did. We need to be pursuing holiness. Here's what he tells us in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. He's imploring them, By the mercies of God, live like you are a temple on two legs. Seek to be holy before the Lord, a virtuous, holy lifestyle unto God set apart from the world, not looking like the world. So to prophesy is to proclaim divine revelation or to speak on behalf of God. So it's not to be taken lightly. Why was, why was prophecy so important at that time, especially? Let's, let's look at that. I mean, if we examine the state of the church in 57 AD, the Bible wasn't even complete at that point. The letters are still being written. At that point in history, there were only three New Testament books that had been written, James, Mark, and Matthew, most likely, in that order even. James may have been around 45 AD, Mark around 50 AD, and Matthew around 55. 
So, in fact, it'd be another 33 years before the book of Revelation would even be written, and it would take another century before the Bible would be compiled and then ultimately canonized into the 66 books that we have now. So, again, what we, we can t- dabble in history there. I love taking bunny trails into history, but, but I'll tell you that it was at least a century before the churches had compiled even what they considered to be the canonized version of the New Testament text. It wasn't even officially recognized until a couple centuries after that. Uh, so a spoken word was critical at the church at this particular time, especially that sought to understand the will of God. And then this is why prophecy and tongues were so esteemed at this particular time, especially. Now, I'm not preaching cessationism here. You've heard me from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I do believe in spiritual gifts. I believe we need it. I believe that's the gift that as the Holy Spirit occupies this space, as the Apostle Paul tells us that we are uh, to be set apart unto the Lord. We're like a temple on two legs, like the Ark of the Covenant on two legs, that the space this Holy Spirit occupies, therefore the Holy Spirit is going to work. The Holy Spirit is going to use you to do the work that you've been called to do, pre-appointed to do by the foreknowledge of God. And so there's work to be done. The Holy Spirit's going to equip you to do that work. So we're not talking about cessationism here. Some have preached that message that the gifts of the Holy Spirit have ceased, that they were needed only for the foundation of the church. I praise God that I'm not alone. I praise God that if I have to stand before uh, public uh, folks who are judges, jury, and executioners who might need to hear the gospel, that if I open my mouth, I could trust the Holy Spirit is going to speak through me. And you have that same gift by way of the Holy Spirit. He says that we're to give, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that's in us. But we can also take confidence in knowing the fact that if the Holy Spirit is in you, you are not alone. You have direct connection to God the Father, and He is going to work through you. But I want you to understand the context here, that prophecy and tongues were so esteemed as they only had three written texts of the New Testament at this particular time. So the gospel message was spreading like wildfire through their testimonies and divine revelation, especially through signs and wonders that were works through the apostles in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. So in other words... Communication was critical, and it needed to be held accountable during the establishment of the church. You didn't want somebody else coming into the church who did not know Jesus, pretended to do so. We read about that in Matthew chapter 7. They may look the part. They were wolves dressed like sheep, and they they could bring destruction into the church with words that were not held accountable to the holy words of God. So apparently this Corinthian church had exalted the gift of tongues— above the prophetic gift of proclaiming truth. And so what Paul wants to do in this chapter is restore a healthy balance to the public worship life that was going on in that congregation. So in in chapter 14, verses 2 to 5, he compares and contrasts the two gifts of speaking in tongues and prophesying. So he even will go on to say that he prefers prophecy over tongues. Let's read verses 2 to 5 here. 1 Corinthians 14, 2 to 5. He says, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. But he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. So as we're going to examine this text, again, this is going to become the baseline for a great conversation over the next few weeks as we examine this text closer. But as we look at it here in the brief time that we have, you can see that Paul is demonstrating how communication occurred between God and man by way of the Holy Spirit. And that's important that we understand that as well from Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 28. He'll highlight this again, especially in this early church. The Holy Spirit is a connection line between God and man. And prophecy was a word from God that was delivered through man by way of the Holy Spirit. It had to be held accountable to God's holy word, though. There has to be a framework for that. There's plenty of texts that would hold that accountable, and the Holy Spirit would never contradict itself. So speaking in tongues was an expression of worship from man to God by way of the Holy Spirit for a divine purpose. It isn't a manifestation of the flesh at all. 
but it generated in the flesh of man, just like the altar of incense before God. So when you go back to Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 13, you'll see that there was a praise of God that was going on in various languages so that those who understood the languages were edified by the praise, though they didn't understand the context of what it meant. So this is why those who were listening were both amazed and perplexed simultaneously in Acts chapter 2, verse 12. The, the speakers were not giving in to some ecstatic utterances, but rather they were speaking in languages of men created by God, according to Genesis chapter 11. And the various dialects, the dialecto that we see in Acts chapter 2, verse 6, for a specific purpose as we discussed at the end of our study in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, we also have to understand here, there are various aspects to tongues that are going to take us a number of weeks to get through here, because I may have already offended some just with what I've said. But Paul has a positive view of speaking in tongues, and he considers it a viable spiritual gift. And some are critical of tongues because of its divisive nature. However, the only problem with tongues is when Christians abuse this gift due to an unhealthy and, yes, even an unbiblical religious doctrine and various perspectives of it. So the problem is never one of any spiritual gift, but rather of those who misunderstand or even misuse what God has graciously provided. So Paul knows that not everyone will be given this gift. Let's, let's just highlight that for a moment. Not everyone is going to receive this gift. And that should be an equalizer right there. Some groups make it an imperative. You must speak in tongues to be a spiritual person. And the Apostle Paul will highlight that not everyone will receive this gift. According to 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 30. So the issue of speaking in tongues, listen, it's created and divided denominations. And that was never the intent. The body was meant to be diverse. In fact, there are those who are cerebral in their worship and others who are more emotional, and yet both are valuable in the proper balance. We talked about the body of Christ. Some are legs, some are feet, some are the neck. Everybody has a, a role. Some are eyes and ears and all valuable and needed for the entirety of the body. This is why when Paul addresses the gift, he, each of the gifts, he's quick to show that we must be as one body body and one mind, according to Romans 15, 6, because these issues divide if they're not taught correctly. Now, I mean, think about it. I don't know how many of you are listening right now. You have children. I have five children. Do you know how difficult it is to get all five of those children in one mind? I mean, everybody has an opinion. So of our household now, there's seven of us, and now some of them are married and children involved. So yes, I have two grandchildren now. So our family circle, just our immediate family, is now getting very large. And just to formulate one agreed decision, one opinion, to be on the same page, I mean, that is almost an impossible task, it feels like. Even politically and all the different things, everybody's got an opinion. I remember when Chuck Smith was sharing on, his, on how his son got in trouble one day. Uh, before getting disciplined for this infraction, uh, Chuck Jr. had reminded his dad of the scripture that says, spare the rod and spoil the child. And bewildered, Chuck Smith looked at him with a puzzled look to which Jr. again said, Dad, you're supposed to spare the rod and spoil the child. <laughs> he had interpreted it as a command to spare the rod conveniently and that he was supposed to be spoiled as a child. Though if he'd actually read the text, it said, He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly, according to Proverbs 13, 24. But all the times of misquoting that verse led to a point of convergence on reality. We do that so often. We hear things said a certain way so many times, we don't even know where to find that in Scripture because the way we've repeated it and turned it into magnets on our refrigerator don't even align with what the actual verse says or even in proper context. So we could try to get these verses to go our way all day long, all we want to, to the end of the day, and the only truth that matters is what Scripture says. Our opinions are like chaff in the wind. 
So like the church of Corinth, we're a body of believers. They were going through issues, and we as the church in 2020 still go through issues. So again, we've got a lot to cover on this subject. I'm going to pause there in this study because I'm going to really take off here and get into this study. I've got some 27 pages of content as we went through this, and that's just part one. We've got a four-part here to talk about this subject of tongues from the entirety of Scripture. That's the way we need to look at this. It's created division far too long. People have been wounded by this. People are so passionate about it that it even supersedes talking about Jesus Christ. We need to get back to the main thing here and understand what does the Bible teach on the subject of tongues. So this is going to take us a few weeks. I want you to be patient with me. You probably have some questions along the way that you think I've just skipped over or haven't answered. I suspect that over the next few weeks, it's probably going to take us a couple months even to get through this. We'll probably get to those questions. Just save them and know that I'm going to be addressing this to great detail. This is something that we spent a lot of time on to try to make sure that there were no questions left unanswered by the end of this study. So I want to thank you in advance for your patience. Thank you for listening to Engage in Truth on a weekly basis. Again, if you've missed the prior broadcast, you want to go catch up on our first Corinthian study, you can do so at calvaryfountain.com. Again, the drop-down there, video, audio, you can select the radio, podcast, you can also watch any of the prior live streams of our broadcast, all of it there for you to use to equip the saints for the work of ministry. We hope that you will form small groups in your home. You'll take it to wherever you're you're attending church right now. Do those small groups. Study the Word of God together. Be equipped as the saints of the Most High to do this work of ministry. I want to thank you again for listening. If you're looking for a church and you want to go deeper in God's Word, check us out at Calvary Fellowship. Fountain Valley. Again, services are 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. on Sunday. We've got groups that meet all week long, though, so if you want to learn how to get connected, visit calvaryfountain.com. God bless you, my friends.